When most people picture Russia in their minds, they picture European Russia, which is literally the part of Russia on the western side that sits in Europe and is by far the most populated part of the country. But European Russia only accounts for 23% of the total territory that is Russia. The other 77% is to the east of European Russia. It starts at the Ural mountain range and it extends all the way over 5 million square miles to the Pacific Ocean. And this vast, mostly forested expanse, which is 50 times bigger than the entire United Kingdom, is called Siberia and Siberia is absolutely brutal. In Siberia, it is almost always freezing cold, literally. The average annual temperature across all of Siberia is 32.9 degrees Fahrenheit, so it is 0.9 degrees above freezing on average every single day. In addition to the extremely deadly weather that exists basically year-round in Siberia, Siberia is also home to a bunch of huge deadly animals, such as the brown bear, which is the same as the infamous grizzly bear in North America, the gray wolf, which by size alone makes virtually all other wolves look like little puppies. Gray wolves can grow to be nearly 200 pounds. And of course, there is the highly intelligent Siberian tiger, who is perhaps one of the only predators on Earth that is known to seek out and kill people for revenge. For example, in 1997, a hunter named Vladimir Markov was walking through a Siberian forest when he came face to face with one of these Siberian tigers, and he ended up shooting the tiger before fleeing, except the tiger didn't die. Instead, it got up and secretly followed Vladimir all the way back to his cabin, and then this tiger camped out outside of the the cabin until Vladimir came out again and the tiger pounced, killed him, and ate him. And so unsurprisingly, Siberia has an absolutely minuscule population relative to its massive size. However, there are some adventurous people out there who are drawn to Siberia for the same reasons that most other people avoid it. These adventurous people see Siberia as one of the last truly wild places on our planet and they want to experience it for themselves. And one of these highly adventurous people was a young man named Colin Madsen. Colin, who came from a very successful American family, was a big outdoors enthusiast who at some point in his youth began researching Siberia because he fell in love with its rugged natural beauty. He quickly began researching not only Siberia, but Siberian culture and Russian culture, and also at some point he became fluent in the Russian language. Then, in 2013, when Colin was 22 years old, he left his home in Missouri and moved to Siberia. He settled in one of Siberia's few population centers, a city called Irkutsk, which is located in the southeast of Siberia and right along the edge of Lake Baikal, which is the world's deepest freshwater lake. Colin's Siberia plan was twofold. He would go to school while he was there, and he would go out and explore. And at first, his plan went perfectly. He was accepted into Moscow State Linguistic University in Irkutsk, and very quickly he made friends who were eager to accompany him on his adventures out into the Siberian wilderness. From his arrival in Siberia in 2013 to 2016, Colin did well in his studies, and he spent countless hours exploring the forests and mountainous areas all around Lake Baikal and right outside of Irkutsk. In fact, Colin became so familiar with this region that he began volunteering with a nonprofit in the area that went around marking new trails, which meant Colin was literally venturing into the wilds of Siberia and just marking the trail as he went. So when Colin's family heard about what happened to him in 2016, they could not believe it. In March of 2016, Colin and three of his good hiking friends, one was American and two were Russian, decided they wanted to go on a hike together. They settled on hiking to the summit of Love Peak, which was a mountain located a few hours away from Irkutsk in a small village called Arshan. This hike was nothing compared to the gnarly Siberian wilderness hikes all four of these guys had been on before. The trail that led up to Love Peak, it was fairly steep, but it was incredibly well marked, and all four of these guys had hiked it several times before. 
However, because Colin and his friends were so experienced at hiking in Siberia, they knew that even the easiest hikes needed to be respected because Siberia was still Siberia. There were dangers that lurked everywhere. And so the men called ahead to the village of Arshan and they rented one of these small rustic cabins that's in the village that sits right at the base of Love Peak and it's kind of tucked away in this forest. And so this cabin would serve as their sort of base camp and would allow them to arrive arrive in Arshan, get their gear together, and then when they were ready, they could begin this hike to the summit. And so a few days later, on March 27th, Colin and his three friends loaded up their car and they drove west to Arshan. And when they got there, they stopped at a local store and got some supplies and then made their way to their cabin. Their cabin was just a single room with a few beds inside of it. It was enough to protect them from the elements, but really nothing more. As for a toilet, the cabin didn't have one, but there was an outhouse outside that they could use. So after the friends moved into the cabin and claimed their beds and put their things down, they all sat down and began prepping their gear and eating some food and chatting. And then finally, at 2 a.m., they decided they needed to go to sleep because their plan was to get on the path up to Love Peak by 7 a.m., which meant they needed to get up at 5 a.m. to make their final preparations. So at 2 a.m., the lights in the cabin turned off and the friends all fell asleep. And then three hours later at 5 a.m., when the lights came back on again, it was immediately clear something was wrong. Colin was not in his bed. His friends assumed when they looked over at his bed and saw his personal belongings were all still there, that Colin must have gotten up and headed outside, maybe to use the outhouse or go for a quick walk, and they just hadn't heard him leaving. And so the three friends initially just kind of shrugged off Colin's absence and said, you know, he'll be back any minute, most likely. And if for some reason he's not back soon, he'll certainly be back by 7 a.m. because that was the agreed upon time they would leave for this hike. But as the minutes ticked closer and closer to 7 a.m. and Colin still had not shown up or tried to call them or do anything, the friends started to worry. It just didn't make any sense that Colin would just get up and leave without telling them where he was going. Finally, at 7 a.m., when Colin still had not shown up and the friend's cursory search of the outside area near the cabin had yielded no results, they decided they had to tell someone. And so they wrote a note addressed to Colin and they put it on the front of their cabin door. And this note basically just told Colin, you know, if you come back here and you see this note, know that we're looking for you. So stay put or tell someone you're here. And so after putting up this note, the friends left the cabin and they headed to the nearest police station where they reported Colin missing. The police would eventually launch this huge search in and around Arshan, both in the forested area right around the village and then and also up into the mountains near Love Peak. But despite this huge effort, no one could find Colin, at least not at first. On Monday, April 4th, so eight days into Colin's disappearance, a group of searchers were looking in the forest about one mile away from the cabin where Colin and his friends had been staying. And they look up ahead and they see there is this clearing and there's something in the middle of it. And so the searchers begin moving their way towards this clearing, ducking under branches and stepping over brush. And when they get close enough, they can see Colin is in the clearing and Colin is deceased. He was laying flat on his back with his left arm extended out to the side and his right arm extended but closer to his body and both of his hands were clenched in tight fists and on his hands and his wrists were visible abrasions and cuts which later would be determined to have most likely been caused from someone or something holding on to him trying to restrain Colin. Colin also had visible abrasions and cuts on the front of his neck. Colin's clothing, which consisted of a long sleeve thermal shirt, heavy pants, and hiking boots, were ripped and torn in several places. And interestingly, Colin was not wearing socks under his boots. Now that seems inconsequential, but Colin had had surgery on both of his ankles and had scar tissue on his ankles that if he didn't have socks on, those scars would rub against the inside of his boot. And he said it was very painful. So he always wore socks. Also, Colin's body showed virtually no signs of decomposition, and all of his wounds and abrasions looked, quote, fresh, according to medical personnel. In short, Colin looked like he had recently been in some sort of physical altercation, and whoever or whatever he was grappling with had eventually overpowered him and killed him. 
although it was not clear how he actually died. Russian authorities were very quick to suspect Colin's three friends who had been with him, but they were brought into the station and they denied having anything to do with Colin's death and they all passed their lie detector tests. After that, Russian authorities quickly closed this case by concluding that, well, if his friends didn't do it, then that means Colin must have been high on drugs or drinking alcohol or both and he just wandered out of his cabin and he got lost in the woods and he died of hypothermia. He froze to death. The end. However, Colin's parents just could not accept that as being what happened to their son. There were a lot of reasons for skepticism, but the main one was that Colin was an absolute expert at navigating this particular region of Siberia. And so the idea that he would leave his cabin for a quick walk or something and get so completely lost that he would die eight days later seemed way too far-fetched. And so Colin's parents hired a US-based private lab to do a review of Russia's autopsy of Colin to give their opinion if the autopsy was accurate or not. And this US-based lab pretty much immediately found that the Russian autopsy was not remotely accurate. Number one, Colin was not under the influence of alcohol or drugs. He was sober. Although technically he did have very small amounts of THC in his urine. THC is the chemical that is found in marijuana, but the amount was so little, it basically meant he had consumed the THC days before he went missing. And so he would not have been remotely affected by that small amount of THC in his system. Number two, the lab determined that Colin Colin almost certainly did not die from hypothermia. Instead, all signs pointed to Colin dying from being suffocated, meaning he was murdered, someone crushed his airway, or in some way restricted him from breathing, and that's what killed him. And three, based on the lack of decomposition, the freshness of the injuries on Colin's body, and the lack of animal predation on his body when they found him, indicated that Colin did not just wander out of his cabin and immediately die somewhere in the forest, Instead, he was alive for most of the time people were looking for him, meaning when they found him, he likely had died within hours of being found. And so these findings by this US-based lab kind of create a general theory about what must have happened to Colin. After Colin left the cabin in the early morning hours of March 28th, maybe to go to the outhouse or to go for a quick walk, when he went outside, someone or something was nearby and they either lured Colin to them or they straight up ambushed Colin and took him away. Now we have no idea what happened to Colin after he was abducted, but we can safely assume that after being abducted and taken somewhere, he was alive and he stayed alive for several days until on the eighth day of his disappearance, Colin was killed, likely by his captor, either at the spot where he was found or he was killed somewhere else, maybe in the forest, and then moved to the spot where he was found. Many people believe it was the Russian government who targeted Colin, they kidnapped him, and they killed him. And their botched investigation into his death was actually a calculated cover-up. Colin had participated in at least one peaceful environmentalist-led protest in Siberia, and after the protest, Colin apparently got a written warning by the Russian police not to attend another protest. But why would Colin, who was just one of many people involved in these protests, be singled out by the Russian government and killed for his participation? And why would the government elect to kill Colin when he was with three of his closest friends who would immediately notice his absence? It just doesn't add up. Today, Colin's parents are still trying to figure out what happened to their son, but unfortunately, their son's case is closed in Russia, and so no one on the Russian side is talking to the parents or giving them any new information. And so as a result, they and the rest of us are left to wonder who or what was lurking in the shadows when Colin stepped out of the cabin that morning. And then where did they take him? And what did they do to him for nearly a week before they killed him deep inside of that Siberian forest?
So that's going to do it. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, the next time the like button hands you their phone and asks you to take a once in a lifetime photo of them, agree to do it, but leave your finger over their lens. Just before 11 p.m. at night on May 20th, 1967, a 50-year-old man named Stefan McCulloch staggered into the Misericordia Hospital in Winnipeg, Canada. Stefan was so physically weak that his oldest son, Mark, was there with him, physically holding him up, carrying him into the hospital. When the nurses at the front desk saw the pair walk in, they immediately got up and walked around their desk over to these two guys and said, hey, what's going on? What's wrong with him? And so Stefan at this point is so uncomfortable, he can barely talk, but he takes a deep breath and then he tells the nurses that earlier that day, he had been burned on his chest and stomach and now he had this blinding headache and he was so nauseous and he could barely walk. The nurses knew clearly this is an emergency and so they quickly ushered the pair down the hall to an exam room and then a couple of minutes later doctors came into the room and they asked Stefan to show them his burns. Stefan who was already lying on his back on the exam table slowly reaches down and grabs the bottom of his shirt and he lifts it up and the doctors are stunned at what they see on his stomach. There was a very strange burn pattern that none of them had seen before. And so the doctors, they move in to get a better look at his injury. And as they're staring at it, they ask Stefan to explain how he got this burn. Now, what the doctors didn't realize is that Stefan was very conflicted. He knew if he told the truth about how he got this burn, then he would open himself and his family up to ridicule and skepticism. But as he's laying there and the doctors are waiting for his answer, he finally decides that the right thing to do here is just tell the truth. And so he takes a deep breath and then tells the doctors what happened to him. And by the time he was finished telling this story of what happened to his stomach, the doctors had stopped looking at his injury and instead were just standing in the middle of the room staring at Stefan with eyes wide and their mouths open. They were all literally speechless. Within 24 hours, Stefan's story had made news all over the world and his story had attracted the attention of numerous US and Canadian secretive government agencies who were keen to interview Stefan one-on-one -on -one to really find out what he knew. In short, what Stefan claimed happened to him, dubbed the Falcon Lake incident, was a very big deal. However, the farther this story went and the more people that heard it, the more people started to question the validity of this story. It just seemed too unbelievable that maybe Stefan is just lying or this is a hoax. And so before I tell you Stefan's actual account of what happened at Falcon Lake, I'm going to give you a little context about who Stefan was prior to the incident. Because ultimately, Stefan's credibility in your eyes will determine if you really believe what happened to him. Stefan was born in the early 20th century in Poland, and when World War II broke out, he was captured by the Nazis and put into one of their concentration camps. It was called the Gross Rosen Camp, and it was located in Poland. During his time at that camp, Stefan would bear witness to the Nazis perpetrating some of the worst atrocities ever committed against humanity. In total, approximately 125,000 people were held prisoner at the Gross Rosen camp, including Stefan. And of those 125,000, 40,000 of them would be killed primarily on site at the camp or on a Nazi-led death march. After the camp was finally liberated in early 1945, Stefan worked as a translator for the U.S. Army, helping them continue to liberate other concentration camps across Europe. But by 1946, Stefan was ready to leave Europe and start a new life somewhere else and put World War II behind him. And so he and his wife, who also was held in a concentration camp during World War II, fled Poland with their three young kids and resettled in Winnipeg, Canada. And for the next 20 years, the McCulloughs lived a very peaceful life. Stefan would find work as a mechanic at a cement factory, and his wife and his kids would make many friends and fall in love with the Winnipeg community. However, the McCulloughs' life would take a sudden turn for the worst on May 20th, 1967. 
That was the day of the Falcon Lake incident. Stefan was a very passionate amateur prospector. A prospector is someone who searches the earth for mineral deposits, usually gold or silver. Stefan would spend much of his off time traveling all over Canada to different wilderness areas to basically hike around the forest and up over the mountains, stopping to hack into the earth with his pickaxe in hope of discovering treasures underneath the surface. Now, Stefan almost never found any treasures on any of his prospecting journeys, but he wasn't really in prospecting for the riches. Stefan just loved being outdoors and being in nature. It was very calming and peaceful for him, and considering how traumatic his earlier life had been, being in the concentration camp during World War II, finding moments of peace in his life was very important to him. And so, in May of 1967, Stefan decided to go out on another one of his prospecting trips, this time to an area called Falcon Lake. Falcon Lake is a fairly large lake located about 100 miles to the east of Winnipeg and surrounding this lake was a big forest that Stefan had heard contained silver deposits tucked away in the hillsides. And so on Friday, May 19th, Stefan was ready to go on this trip, and so he packed up all of his prospecting equipment, he said goodbye to his wife and his kids, and then he left the house and made his way to the bus stop where he hopped on a Greyhound bus. Two hours later, he got off the bus at the stop closest to Falcon Lake, and from there, he made his way to this cheap motel that was right on the side of the highway. He got a room, he got a quick bite to eat in their cafe, and then returned to his room and went to bed. The next morning, May 20th, 1967, so the day of the Falcon Lake incident, Stefan woke up early, right around 5 a.m., and by 5.30 a.m., he had all of his equipment either in his backpack or on his belt, and he was making his way out of the motel's front doors. Right outside of this motel was the highway that ran left to right, and on the other side of that highway was this huge forest that Falcon Lake was deep inside of. And so after Stefan left the motel, he crossed over that highway and began walking into the woods. And for the next several hours, Stefan just kind of meandered his way through the woods. He wasn't on a trail, he was just using his compass to make sure he was generally walking in the direction of Falcon Lake. At around 9 a.m., so he's been hiking now for several hours, he looked up ahead and he saw there was a clearing on the side of this hill. And so Stefan walked into this clearing and two things became immediately apparent. One, he was right near Falcon Lake. From his perspective on this clearing, he could look down just a couple of hundred feet and there was the lake. And two, the reason this clearing existed and why no trees were growing on it at all is because under his feet was just a huge rock face, like a quartz vein that was running across this hillside. And so this was like the perfect place for Stefan to begin prospecting. And so he set his things down, he got out his pickaxe, he got his welding gloves on, he put on his welding goggles as well. They protected his eyes from any rocks that were flying as he was hacking into the ground. And then he got to work. For the next couple of hours, Stefan very diligently hacked away at this big rock, but he didn't find any silver or anything else of note. And so around 11 a.m., Stefan was hungry and tired, and so he put his pickaxe down, he took his goggles off, he took his gloves off, and he sat down on this rock facing the lake to have some lunch. And as he sat there enjoying his food, all he could hear in the distance were the sound of a few geese down on the lake making some noise, but other than that, it was totally quiet. After he was done eating, he put his gear back on and got back to work. About an hour later, at around 12.15 p.m., Stefan was still hacking away at the rock, when, despite all the noise he was making as he smashed the ground with his pickaxe, he could hear a really loud commotion coming from behind him. And it turned out when he stopped the pickaxe, the commotion sounded like geese honking and going wild. And so he dropped his pickaxe, he took his goggles, put them up on his forehead, and then he stood up and he turned around and he looked down towards the lake where he heard all these geese going crazy. And the first thing he noticed was there were some geese on the lake that appeared to be flying off in different directions like they had been startled. But what really immediately caught his attention was not the geese, but what had very likely startled the geese. And that was two bright glowing red objects that were flying slowly across the lake towards him, kind of roughly over where the geese were. 
And now these objects, they were cylindrical. They appeared to be about maybe 30 or 40 feet wide. They didn't have any sort of emission coming off of them. They weren't making any noise. They were just kind of slowly making their way over towards where Stefan was. Now, as Stefan is watching this happen, he wasn't fearful. He assumed those have to be military aircraft. As it was, this part of Canada, Falcon Lake, is very remote. There's not many people around. And so, logically, it made sense that perhaps there's a military that's doing training exercises in this area. And so, feeling much more intrigued than fearful, Stefan just continued to watch as these red aircraft got closer and closer to his side of the lake. And then, when these two craft were about 200 feet away from where Stefan was standing, they came to a stop and they were just hovering in the air. Air, and then one of the craft suddenly turned orange and began going up into the clouds and then at some point just vanished. And then the other craft, instead of going up, just continued descending very slowly, now very clearly towards this open rock face that Stefan was standing on. Now again, Stefan was totally convinced that these were military aircraft, you know, conducting some sort of exercise. And so he's not fearful. He is just intrigued by what he's seeing. And and in fact, by this point, he had convinced himself that this second aircraft that was now coming down to land on these rocks must have experienced some sort of issue and they were landing in order to fix it. And Stefan even thought to himself, well, hey, I'm a mechanic. Maybe I can help the pilot or pilots with whatever's going on with their craft. Once the craft finally did touch down on the rocks about 150 feet away from Stefan, it changed colors from red to stainless steel with an orange glow around the outside of the aircraft. And inside of this craft, a really bright purple light came on that Stefan was only aware of because there was a couple of small holes on the outside of this craft where this purple light was coming through. But these little rays of purple light coming out of this craft were so bright that it actually was hard for Stefan to look directly at the craft. And so his welding goggles were still on his forehead. So he pulled them down, put them over his eyes, and his welding goggles had a kind of tint to them. So it was like he was looking through sunglasses. And with those on, he was able to continue looking at the craft. And so through his goggles, Stefan is still just standing in the same spot where he first saw these craft. And he's watching this craft that's now landed 150 feet away from him. And he's fully expecting any minute for the pilot or pilots to come out of the craft and explain what's going on. But at first, nothing happens. And so Stefan is just standing there waiting for something to happen when he realizes he has his sketchbook in his pocket. Stefan liked to bring his sketchbook along on his prospecting trips because he liked to sketch things. And so he figured while he waited for the pilot or pilots to emerge, he would sketch the craft. And so for the next couple of minutes, that's what he did. And then after he was done sketching it, he put his sketchbook away and then really nothing happened for about another 30 minutes. He just stood there and the craft remained motionless. But after about 30 minutes of the craft having landed, it opened. There was like a sliding door on the side of the craft facing Stefan and it revealed the beautiful bright purple interior of this craft. But from Stefan's perspective, because of how bright the lights were and how far away he was, he couldn't tell what was inside of the craft. But Stefan's thinking, okay, clearly now the pilot or pilots are coming outside. And so Stefan felt really relieved and he was just standing there waiting to talk to whoever was inside. But again, nothing happened. And so now feeling just plain curious, Stefan decided, you know what, I'm going to walk over there and I'm going to yell into this open door to the pilot or pilots inside and make sure they're okay. And so he starts slowly making his way across the rock face towards this craft and this open door. And when he gets about 60 feet away from the craft, he suddenly stops because now he can hear from inside of this craft the sound of two voices talking to each other. He can't really tell what they're saying, but very clearly there is communication happening inside of this craft. And so Stefan assumed that must be the pilots. And so he called out to them in English. And the second Stefan yelled out to this craft, the voices immediately came to a stop and they did not respond to Stefan. 
And so Stefan is calling out to them in English, you know, hey, are you okay? What are you doing in there? And when English didn't work, Stefan called out in Russian. He called out in German, Italian, French, Ukrainian. And when all of those didn't work, he went back to English and just continued kind of calling out, trying to get them to please come out and talk to him. But he got no response and no one came out of the craft. And so at this point, Stefan thought, okay, I'm totally committed, so I need to keep going and make sure the pilot or pilots are okay. And so he continued walking closer and closer to this open door of the craft. And when he got about 10 feet away, he was suddenly struck by the incredible craftsmanship of this craft. He couldn't see any rivets anywhere on this amazing piece of machinery, meaning this craft appeared like it had somehow been carved out of one enormous piece of steel, which seemed totally impossible. Also, Stefan noticed there were no insignia on the outside of this craft. There was no flag or anything kind of denoting who was flying it. There was really nothing on the outside of the craft. But Stefan just kept on going until he was standing right outside of this open door. He's only a couple feet away from it. And now he's looking directly inside and he doesn't see the pilot or pilots. And in fact, because of how bright this purple light is coming out, even with his goggles, it's really hard to see what's inside of this craft. But he can clearly see inside there is some sort of panel in the back of the craft with lots of flashing lights, almost like a computer. And there were other kind of columns of light moving around inside the craft at different angles. But after looking in this craft for only a few seconds, the door suddenly slid shut. And then Stefan, without really thinking about it, reached out and touched the craft. And the second he did that, two things happened. One, the hand that he touched the craft with, he was wearing a big welding glove. And the second he made contact with that craft, the leather glove began to melt, not even catch on fire. It just instantly began to melt. And so he began frantically ripping the glove off to get it off of him to avoid injury. And then the second thing that happened is the craft began rotating counterclockwise until this vent that was on the outside of the craft, one of the very few things that was on the outside of the craft that actually Stefan had noted in his sketch. He had drawn this grate that sat on the outside of the craft. This grate rotated around until it was aimed directly at Stefan. Now, to picture this grate, picture like a vent you would see inside of a building where air conditioning blows air out of, right? It's kind of like that same size, the size of a license plate on a car. And instead of there being vertical slats along the vent, like you would see with an air conditioning vent cover, on this vent, on this craft, it was like a checkerboard pattern with little buttonholes all over this vent. And so Stefan is looking at this vent and then suddenly something shoots through the vent like an explosion that hits him square in the chest and lights him on fire. His shirt is literally in flames. And so Stefan is frantically trying to rip off his shirt. He throws it on the ground. He's stomping the flame. And as he's doing that, he looks up and sees this craft has somehow immediately shot into the sky and is now disappearing into the clouds. Now, Stefan had no idea what just happened. All he knew is his chest and his stomach now hurt tremendously. But before he could deal with that, he developed this unbelievable headache. He suddenly felt so nauseous and he felt delirious like he was drunk. Trying not to panic, Stefan, who now is shirtless and badly burned, he ran over and grabbed some of his things, and then he began heading back into the woods to make his way back towards the motel. It would take him several hours of stumbling through the forest, stopping periodically to vomit, but he would eventually reach the highway, he would cross over, and he would make his way into the motel right around 4 p.m. And when he got there, he made his way into the cafe, and he asked the staff if they knew where the nearest doctor was. These staff members would later tell investigators that when Stefan came tumbling into the cafe without his shirt on, looking totally horrible, they assumed he was drunk. But after talking to him, he didn't smell at all like alcohol. Instead, he reeked of this horrible sulfur smell. The staff would tell Stefan that the nearest doctor was 45 miles away. And so at this point, Stefan decided his best bet was actually to just get on a bus and go back to Winnipeg where his family could take him to the nearest hospital. And so somehow Stefan managed to make his way to the bus stop. He hopped on a Greyhound bus. He went to Winnipeg and then his oldest son, Mark, met him at the bus stop and practically carried him into the hospital. 
the very strange checkerboard burn pattern found on Stefan's abdomen, where he claims this craft turned its vent then fired on him, were determined not to be thermal burns, meaning he didn't get them from something hot touching his skin, like everyone initially suspected. Instead, they were determined to be chemical burns, but literally no one, doctors, scientists, government agencies, no one could figure out what chemical actually burned his skin. In fact, no one was ever able to actually identify what was causing all of these ailments that Stefan was complaining of, from the headache, to the nausea, to the weakness, to these burns. And he was tested for basically everything, from radiation poisoning to very common ailments and illnesses, and everything came back negative. Experts would go out to Falcon Lake, to the area that Stefan described seeing this craft, and sure enough, they would find an open rock face, and right around the area that Stefan and described was the circular burn pattern as if something had been perched right there that shot some sort of exhaust into the ground and the area around this landing site was determined to be highly radioactive although it is assumed that the reason that area is radioactive is because there is a vein of radium that runs underneath the rocks near the area however what no one could explain away were the three identical pieces of what looked like metal which actually turned out to be a very rare type of silver that were located near this burn circle. Now, even though the Falcon Lake area was known apparently for having silver deposits up in the hillsides, this silver, these three pieces of silver, were not from the hillsides of Falcon Lake. This silver was heavily manufactured. Someone, something, some machine had manipulated the metal to bend and be cut in a very particular way. And all three of these pieces of very rare silver were highly radioactive. They would also find traces of this very rare type of silver that seemed to have seeped into some of the loose rocks that were inside of that burned out circle, almost like the silver had melted into the rock. But despite these pieces of evidence that do seem to suggest that Stefan really did see some craft land on these rocks, and despite the fact that the US government and the Canadian government both thoroughly investigated this case and they were not able to debunk it, they basically said, well, something happened, but we don't know what. Despite all of that, Stefan and his family's lives were forever upended after this incident. Stefan was ridiculed and accused of lying and of being crazy, and his kids were unfortunately bullied at school. Shortly before Stefan died in 1999 at the age of 83, he was asked if he regretted coming forward with this story. And he would say, yes, I wish I never told anyone. But he would also say, at the time, he really felt like he had a duty to tell the world about what happened. Stefan never changed his story, and he never came out and said, I think this craft came from another world, another planet, another universe. He just said, look, I think it was an experimental aircraft. That's it. He also never made a dime on this experience. If anything, he lost money because he paid to write a 40-page pamphlet that explained what happened to him, and then he left all these copies on his porch. So if news people showed up or if nosy neighbors showed up and had questions, he would just point to the stack of the books and say, take one and read it. So that's going to do it. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please ask the like button if you can borrow their favorite DVD, but instead of watching it, use it to play frisbee with your dog and then return it. While she was in high school in Dayton, Ohio, Raquel Bain became known as a bit of a thrill seeker, primarily because she would do something called car surfing, which is exactly what it sounds like. She would climb onto the exterior of cars and hold on to the roof while somebody else drove it around. In addition to seeking out these physical thrills, Raquel was also drawn to psychological ones, like going to places that were supposedly haunted and seeing if she could spook herself. 
Following high school, Raquel kind of calmed down and became less of the wild teenager she was known for being, and instead she really focused on building a life and a career for herself. And so she would go to college and she would earn her degree in surgical technologies, and then by 2009 she was employed full-time as a surgical assistant in Dayton. Also around that time, she had her first child, a son, who she adored. But despite creating this life full of stereotypically adult, mature things, like having a career and starting a family, deep down, Raquel was still very much the thrill-seeking wild teenager she was back in high school. But as an adult, she just never had time to go seek out those thrills. So with that in mind, fast forward to April of 2016, by this point, Raquel is 26 years old, and that month, a very rare weekend popped up where Raquel did not have to work and she didn't have any childcare responsibilities. And so wanting to take advantage of this free time, Raquel asked her boyfriend, 41-year-old David Nee, if he would join her on a road trip that weekend to Louisville, Kentucky, where Raquel wanted to check out the infamously scary Waverly Hills Sanatorium. Back in the 1900s, Waverly Hills was a place where tuberculosis patients were sent. Tuberculosis, or TB for short, is an infection of the lungs and it can be deadly. Today, there's a cure for it, but back in the early 1900s, there wasn't. And so most of the people who went to Waverly Hills died there and usually very slowly and painfully and in total isolation from their families because in virtue of being sent to Waverly Hills, they were effectively being quarantined to stop the spread of the disease. Waverly Hills would eventually shut down permanently in 1961 because by that point the cure had been found and after it shut down the building basically just sat there. Nobody else came in and turned it into anything else. And so this building is basically abandoned and lots of people began sneaking in to see what it was like in there and a shocking number of these trespassers reported seeing ghosts inside. Today, the sanatorium is still very much in the same condition it was left in, but the Waverly Hills Historical Society has stepped in and made it very hard for people to sneak into the building. However, knowing people do want to go in and look around, the Historical Society has begun offering guided tours of the sanatorium, and these tours are given exclusively at night to increase the spooky effect. And so David, who had only been dating Raquel for a month when she asked him to come with her to the sanatorium, he was not really that keen on doing this. It did not really appeal to him to go walking around this totally terrifying place, but he could tell it was important to Raquel. She was really excited about it, and so he agreed to go. A few days later, on the late afternoon of April 23rd, the new couple left Raquel's place, they climbed into the car, and they began driving south. Three hours later, they arrived in Louisville and they stopped to get dinner. And then after they were done eating, they looked at the time and realized it was only about 6.45 p.m. And the tour they had scheduled at the sanatorium was not until 10 p.m. So they had a few hours to kill. And before David could suggest anything, Raquel already had the perfect idea of how they should kill this time. She told David that earlier that day, she had learned about a spot just outside of Louisville that might actually be more terrifying than the sanatorium they had come all this way to see. And so Raquel wanted to spend these few hours checking out this new spooky spot. This spooky spot was a rickety old, narrow, abandoned looking bridge called the Pope Lick Trestle. It's located just east of downtown Louisville in this heavily wooded area. The bridge is about 800 feet long, and at its highest point, right in the middle of the bridge, it's about 90 to 100 feet off the ground. And this bridge connects the tops of two of the bigger rolling hills in the area. But the bridge's physical appearance has nothing to do with why it's considered so spooky. The reason the Pope Lick Trestle has become a central part of Kentucky folklore is because locals say there is a monster called the Pope Lick Monster that lives underneath the bridge. It's half goat, half man, and when anyone is near this bridge at night, this monster is supposed to come out from underneath this bridge. And then what happens next is very ambiguous. It kind of depends on who you're talking to. But generally speaking, once the Pope Lick Monster has emerged and it sees you, 
you're dead. Now, how you die ranges from the monster leaping out and attacking you with an axe to the monster using some sort of mind control to lure you up onto the bridge where you leap off. David, after hearing this suggestion, was again not really that keen to go do this really terrifying sounding thing, but seeing the excitement in his girlfriend's face, he agreed to go. And so the two left the restaurant, they climbed back in the car, and they drove for about 15 or 20 minutes to the Pope Lick Trestle Bridge. The bridge actually passed over a relatively main road, and so the couple parked just off the side of this main road, and then once they were outside, they began looking for a pathway up this hillside to get up to the bridge. And very quickly, they found a well-worn dirt path that snaked up the side of this wooded hillside that looked very much like it would bring them up to the bridge. So with Raquel in front and David behind her, they began walking up this dirt path. And as they're walking, they start to see signs that clearly say, no trespassing. But they ignore them because they're looking at this path thinking, okay, lots of people clearly come up here, so we've got to be okay. And so they keep on walking up this path and they're getting closer and closer to the top of this hill where they think it's going to connect with this bridge. And right as they're getting close, they see there's this huge chain link fence, this eight foot tall chain link fence with barbed wire across the top that extends in either direction out of view. And so the couple walks up to this fence and there are more signs that say no trespassing, private property property, and there are additional warning signs saying that what is on the other side of this fence is also just plain dangerous, so turn around and leave. As Raquel and David are staring at all these signs and this fence, they see not far from the path, somebody had clearly bent two of the fence posts and created a narrow gap in the fence that you could slip through. And so from David and Raquel's perspective, that looked like the way other trespassers must have found their way up to the bridge and so it must be safe. And so once again, the couple disregarded all the warnings, they made their way over to this gap in the fence, they both slipped through and they kept on walking up the hill. Just a couple of minutes later, they reached this clearing, which was at the top of this hill. And once they were in this clearing, they were able to turn and they could actually see the bridge. It was only a couple hundred feet away from them. And it was totally intimidating. By this point, it's totally dark out. And from their perspective, all they see is this very narrow bridge that they know is 100 feet off the ground at certain points. And they can see there's no guardrails on either side of this bridge. It would have almost looked like a tightrope kind of extended ending off into the darkness. But even if the couple was really intimidated by the sight of this bridge and with all these warning signs before it, they were able to put their fear aside and just keep on going. And so with David now in the lead and Raquel behind him, they walked the couple of hundred feet over to the start of this narrow bridge. And when they got there, without actually stepping onto the bridge, David came to a stop. He turned around to face Raquel and he gestured for her to come stand next to him so they could take a selfie with the bridge in the background. Because David at this point is thinking, we're not going to go on this bridge. We're just going to look at this bridge, take some pictures, and then we'll go. But Raquel, who he's looking at, gestured to come stand with him, just walks right past him onto the bridge and takes several steps out onto this narrow rickety old thing. And then she stops, turns around and gestures for David to come with her and walk across the entire bridge. And David again is having his second thoughts, but he sees Raquel wants to do this. And so he agrees to go. After they had walked about 100, maybe 200 feet across this bridge, the two of them just started laughing because it was totally exhilarating what they were doing. Not so much the quest for the Popelik monster, but rather the very real risk they were taking walking this tightrope bridge in the middle of the night. The couple would continue to very cautiously but quickly make their way across this bridge. And when they reached about the halfway point, when they were at the highest point from the ground, the bridge itself begins to shake. And then from behind them, they hear this loud grinding sound. And so the couple, they whip their heads around and they see there are these two bright glowing lights that are looking right at them all the way on the start of the bridge. And they realize it's a train. 
When Raquel and David walked up that dirt path and snuck through the fence and reached the top of the hill and could actually see the Pope Lick Trestle Bridge, they would have also seen the train tracks in the hillside that clearly extended onto the Pope Lick Trestle and went across the bridge. This was a train bridge. They would have seen that. But it's assumed that the couple who didn't live in the area and so didn't know much about the Pope Lick Trestle, it's assumed they thought, well, you know, this is a train bridge, but it's got to be abandoned. It certainly looks abandoned, and it does. It looks totally old. It does not look active, even though it is. Or the couple thought, well, this is just an old train bridge. It might be active, but surely no train is going to come through anytime soon. We can get across the bridge before a train arrives. But of course, they were wrong. When the couple turned around and saw these two headlights bearing down on them, they quickly realized they would not be able to outrun this train. The train's clearly trying to stop. It has seen them. It's hitting its brakes. It's sounding its horn, but it's just clearly moving too quickly. So they cannot run to the other side to safety. And because this bridge was meant for a single train to pass through, there was no other track they could just jump onto to avoid being hit. And there were no walk ways on either side of this railway. And so literally all they had was the track that this train was going to cross over and they were on it. And so with no other choices, David yells to Raquel that they have to climb down and hang off the side of this bridge. Now, there were these wooden slats that ran underneath the rails. They ran perpendicular to the rails. And these wooden slats kind of extended off the edge of the bridge on either side, just a couple of inches. And so in theory, if you were holding onto the outside of one of these wooden slats and kind of dangling off the edge of the bridge, a train could cross those tracks and not run over your hands or fingers. You would just have to hold on that whole time as the train is rumbling through. And so David, he flops down onto his stomach and he's trying to lower himself as fast as he can as this train is getting closer and closer. And he's yelling for Raquel to do the same thing, but she's not really moving very quickly. And finally, David, he gets in position. He's hanging off the edge of this bridge on these wooden slats and he sees Raquel. She's not quite there. And then the train comes flying through. It strikes Raquel and sends her flying off the bridge to the ground below. David David would somehow manage to hold on the whole time as this train went past him. And then once the train had passed him, he pulled himself back up onto the tracks. He ran the rest of the way across the bridge. He went down that hillside. And when he found Raquel, it was immediately apparent that she was deceased. In the end, the railroad was not issued any citations or sued for negligence. It was determined they did their due diligence by setting up that eight foot tall barbed wire fence with all those signs telling people to stay back and warning people about the hazards of going past this fence. And so it was actually David who got in trouble for this tragedy. He was cited and charged with a felony of unlawfully disrupting and or delaying a train causing financial damages. He would plead to a lesser charge of trespassing and and would be fined $2,300. Shockingly, this tragedy is just one of many that have occurred on the Pope Lick Trestle Bridge. Since the bridge's construction in the 1800s, there have been dozens of people who have died on this bridge. And several of these deaths, many of them fairly recent, the last 20 or so years, have occurred under the same conditions as Raquel's. People went looking for the Pope Lick monster and then were struck by a train. So that's going to do it. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please offer to do the like buttons dishes, but be sure to leave the cups and bowls right side up in their dishwasher. In 1998, the Barber family was living a charmed life. Michael and Elizabeth had been happily married for 20 years, and they had three beautiful daughters who ranged in age from 9 to 15, and they were all thriving. The family lived in a very modest, plain-looking home in Melbourne, Australia, but the second you stepped foot inside of that home, you would see it was bursting with life. The sounds of kids laughing and playing, and of Michael and Elizabeth happily chatting away filled every room. Now, the Barbers' lives were not perfect by any means. In fact, they struggled financially and lived basically paycheck to paycheck. 
However, they didn't let their financial struggles define them. Instead, Michael and Elizabeth put a lot of stock in another aspect of their lives that they were all undeniably rich in, and that was in creativity. Michael was a toy maker and a designer, and Elizabeth worked in children's literature. And each of the three Barber children were beginning to cultivate their own unique creative gifts. At nine years old, Heather, who was the youngest, had developed a lovely singing voice. Ashley Rose, who was the middle child at 11 years old, had learned to play the flute. But the Barber's oldest daughter, 15-year-old Rachel, was really the star of the family. In fact, they called her that, Rachel Star. Rachel was an extremely talented dancer. She was so graceful and stylish that even when she was just walking around, it almost looked like she was dancing. Rachel was also very beautiful, with big emerald green eyes and fair skin, and she had this effortless charisma that just drew people to her. From the outside, Rachel really did look like the kid who had everything going for her, but, like the rest of us, Rachel had her own struggles. Like she was not a natural student. No matter how hard she tried, math and science just seemed impossible to her. And Rachel had a number of acute fears that really made certain aspects of her life very challenging. She was deathly afraid of the dark. She was afraid of talking to strangers. She was afraid of navigating the public transportation system on her own. And even just the thought of going into a store by herself filled her with immense dread. As a result of having these fears, Rachel was actually very dependent on her parents. Her mother, Elizabeth, would jokingly say that Rachel was 15, going on 18, going on 12. Eventually, when Rachel's anxieties and fears, combined with her struggles with traditional schoolwork, put her into a bit of a depression, her parents decided they needed to step in and take action. They wanted their Rachel star to be happy. They wanted to encourage her and nurture her strengths. And the thing that they knew she loved the most and was the best at was dance. So in September of 1998, Michael and Elizabeth allowed Rachel to drop out of her traditional school and transfer to a full-time dance school in Richmond, which was an inner city suburb of Melbourne located about 20 minutes away from the barber's house. And once Rachel was enrolled in this new dance school, she blossomed. She made loads of new friends, she started modeling, which was something she was very proud of, and she met a boy, Manny, who she absolutely adored. But as well as things seemed to be going for Rachel at her new school, she would soon make a fateful decision that would have absolutely catastrophic effects. On Monday, March 1st of 1999, so five months after Rachel had transferred to this new dance school, Rachel and her father, Michael, like every other morning, left the Barber household, climbed into Michael's car, and began driving to Waddle Park, which was a train station closest to their house. From Waddle Park, Rachel would catch a train that would take her to the Richmond station, and then she would get off, she would meet up with a friend, they would have breakfast, and they would walk the rest of the way to their dance school. When Michael pulled into the parking lot at Waddle Park and parked the car, and Rachel was getting her stuff to climb out of the vehicle to head up to the train, he stopped his daughter and said, hey, remember, I'll be back here at 6.15 tonight to pick you up. And Rachel looked at him, she smiled and said, okay, and then she hopped out of the car and she pranced her way over to the station. Michael watched his daughter just long enough to see her climb the steps and disappear, at which point he put his car back in drive, he left the lot, and he headed back home. That evening, Michael returned to Waddle Park. But at 6.15 p.m., when the train came rolling into the station, Rachel was not on board. Michael assumed his daughter must have been running late and so missed the train she would always take, and so he just sat in the parking lot and waited for the next train to come into the station. And a few minutes later, when it pulled into the station, Rachel was not on that train either. And so Michael, he was starting to get worried because he's looking outside, it's getting dark, he knows his daughter hates being out in the dark, she's afraid of being alone, and he's wondering, you know, what's going on with her, but he keeps telling himself that she's bound to show up any minute. And so Michael just sat in this parking lot and watched train after train after train come through the station, and Rachel wasn't on any of them. Now, Michael didn't have a cell phone, and neither did Rachel, so he couldn't just call her to see where she was. But finally, after a few more trains came through and none of them contained his daughter, he left the parking lot but went to his parents' house, which was much closer than his own home. And he rushed inside and he grabbed their phone and he called back to his home. And when his wife, Elizabeth, Rachel's mom, picked up the phone, he immediately asked her, hey, is Rachel home? Did she get a ride home from one of her friends? 
and Elizabeth would tell Michael, no, she's not here and she hasn't called. This was the moment when Michael and Elizabeth instinctively knew something had to be wrong. Rachel was on time for everything and if she was late, she would always call ahead or call afterwards and at least give some explanation. But to just go silent and not show up, that was not in character. And again, because it was pitch black outside and they knew she was probably alone, that was a situation they knew Rachel would never want to be in because it would have terrified her. And so Michael tells Elizabeth he's going to come home as fast as he can. They hang up. And then while Elizabeth is waiting for her husband to return, she picked the phone right back up and she dialed Manny's number. That's Rachel's boyfriend. She figured maybe Rachel was with Manny or at the very least, maybe she checked in with Manny because most nights Rachel and Manny spoke on the phone. But when Manny picked up the phone, he would tell Elizabeth that he hasn't seen Rachel since earlier in the day and she has not called him, which to him was odd. When Elizabeth asked Manny, you know, what was my daughter doing when you were with her last? Manny would say, oh, we went out to a shopping mall near the school in Richmond and we went to the shoe store and Rachel actually walked up to a very particular set of shoes. They were these big platform blue chunky shoes and she said that she was going to buy them the next day and she was really excited about it. And Elizabeth as she's hearing this, she knew exactly the shoes that Manny was describing because just the day before, Rachel had taken her mom, Elizabeth, to the shoe store and pleaded with her to get those blue chunky platform shoes. But when Elizabeth had looked at the price tag, they were $100 and so they were too expensive. And so as Elizabeth is hearing Manny say that her daughter is talking about how she's going to buy these shoes the next day, Elizabeth is thinking, with what money? Rachel has no money. How could she possibly afford those shoes? And so she asked Manny, you know, did Rachel say how she planned on affording those blue shoes? And Manny would say, actually, yeah, she told me that she had this secret job, but she wouldn't give me any more details about it. And she said that with the money from this secret job, she'd be able to buy these shoes. Manny would tell Elizabeth that Rachel really stressed that this secret job was nothing to worry about. It was nothing immoral. But as Elizabeth is listening to Manny tell her this, all her alarm bells are going off. She could not fathom any job that would require a 15-year-old girl to go out by herself at night doing something that was secret and give absolutely no information to her family. Every possibility just seemed bad. After hanging up the phone with Manny, Elizabeth began frantically calling all of Rachel's friends and acquaintances and different locations around town that she knew her daughter would frequent, but nobody had any information about where Rachel was. A little while later, Michael finally pulled into the driveway and when he went inside, he talked to his wife briefly, but he could tell they had no new information. Their daughter was still not home. This was becoming a crisis. And so very quickly, Michael just left the house, got right back into his car and he drove to the police station. But when he got to the police station, the police didn't really offer the response that he was hoping for. From the police's perspective, it sounded like a teenage girl has been missing for a few hours. And so in their mind, they're thinking, one, that's not an emergency yet. And two, she probably just kind of ran off. Teenagers do that. They come back the next day. It's normal. And so despite Michael's pleas to the police that, no, this is different. My daughter would never do that. She would never run away. This is totally out of character, despite all those pleas, the police said, look, Michael, just go home, wait, your daughter will be home soon. And if for some reason in the next few days, she does not come back home, you come back and you tell us. And so Michael, now feeling totally devastated and terrified for his daughter's safety, finally did just leave the police station and he headed back home. And then he and his wife and his two other daughters had a terrible restless night's sleep, wondering what was going on with Rachel. And then finally, when the sun came up the next morning, Michael and Elizabeth rushed out of their bedroom and headed into the kitchen, hoping, praying that Rachel would just magically be in their house again. But when they went into the kitchen, Rachel wasn't there. She had not come home. However, pretty early on, on the second day of Rachel's disappearance, Michael and Elizabeth would learn something new. Manny would get in touch with Michael and Elizabeth, and he would tell them that he remembered something Rachel had said during their final conversation the day before. She had told Manny that he had nothing to worry about with regards to this secret job because it wasn't immoral, it was totally safe. And, Manny said, Rachel said there was an old female friend who was going to be there at this job site in some way participating that would keep her safe. 
And so Michael and Elizabeth have no idea what to make of this old female friend, but in a way it was kind of a relief because they know their daughter is basically terrified to be alone. And so at least knowing wherever she was, she was with this old friend, that made them feel good. But the parents' positivity about this new development quickly faded when they began calling around to all of Rachel's friends, both new and old, female and otherwise, and none of them were missing. Everybody was where they were supposed to be, and nobody knew anything about what happened to Rachel. The only intel the parents got from this round of calling all of her friends was that several of her friends said that the day before, the day Rachel disappeared, they had walked with Rachel back to the train station after school. And in fact, one of the friends told Michael and Elizabeth that they offered Rachel a ride home so that she wouldn't have to ride the train back home. But Rachel had turned it down, saying her father was going to be meeting her on the other end at Waddle Park at 6.15 p.m. The Barbers didn't know what to make of this. Did Rachel believe at the time that she could go do this secret job and still be back in time to meet her father at 615 at Waddle Park? Or did she lie to the friend who was offering the ride and make up the story that she planned on seeing her father when in reality she planned on ditching her father and going and doing this secret job for the night? But regardless of which of these things were true, the parents just still could not understand why by now, 24 hours later, their daughter still had not called to check in. Michael and Elizabeth found themselves wondering if they really knew their Rachel star as well as they thought they did. You know, maybe she had actually run away like the police suggested. The parents were totally distraught, they were totally anxious and terrified, and so with nothing else to do, over the next several days, they just continued to go out and look everywhere and talk to everyone to try to find where their daughter was. But everything they looked into turned into a dead end. Then, finally, on Monday, March 8th, so exactly one week since Rachel had disappeared, Michael and Elizabeth got a new lead. A girl named Allison, who had gone to a dance class with Rachel before Rachel had transferred schools, had overheard her younger sister talking about the Rachel Barber disappearance and how nobody had seen or heard from Rachel since 5.45 p.m. the previous Monday. Allison, who had not heard about Rachel's disappearance until this very moment, knew immediately she had to go forward and talk to police because she actually saw Rachel on the night she disappeared, a full hour after her last known sighting. At 6.40 p.m. on the night Rachel disappeared, Allison was on the train car headed to Praron, which is a suburb located southeast of where Rachel lived. And when this train that Allison was on pulled into the Richmond station and the doors opened up, Allison watched as Rachel, along with this other girl who Allison didn't recognize, walked on board and then took seats right next to each other on the other end of the train away from Allison. Now, from Allison's perspective, immediately it was clear they were friends. They were laughing and joking together and just kind of in their own world. And so Allison didn't want to be rude, so she stopped staring at them, and they continued riding the train until they got to the Praron station, at which point Allison got up to leave the train. But as she did, she saw Rachel and this mystery girl. They also had stood up, and they were making their way out of the door. And as they were leaving, Rachel actually would look up and see Allison, and they would both smile and wave at each other. But that was it. And then Allison would watch as Rachel and her friend would leave ahead of her, and they would walk down the platform. And from Allison's perspective, it seemed obvious that Rachel and this girl were friends, and whatever they were going to go do, they were choosing to go do, and they were going to do together. When Michael and Elizabeth heard about this sighting of their daughter on the train and this mystery girl, on the one hand, it was kind of reassuring because it meant that Rachel was with this friend, potentially the old female friend that Rachel mentioned to Manny, and so whatever she was doing, at least she was not alone. But on the other hand, it begged the question of what role did this mystery person play in wherever Rachel was now? Had Rachel and this mystery girl gone to do this secret job together and then something happened to them? Or had this mystery girl been Rachel's accomplice and they had run off together like the police thought? Whatever the case was, the Barbers and the police at this point, who were looking much more seriously into the Barber case by now, they knew the next step was identifying this mystery girl. A couple of days later, on Thursday, March 11th, the police called in an artist to create a sketch of this mystery girl that Allison had seen on the train. Allison would describe this mystery girl as being older than Rachel, being heavier than Rachel, and very plain. 
That day, the police also ordered a trace on all of the phone calls going into the Barber residence on the day before she went missing, because they figured that if Rachel and this mystery girl were in cahoots on some sort of secret thing together, they likely communicated the day before. And when the phone call trace came back, there was one phone number in particular that stood out to police. There was a private phone number that called the Barber household twice on the day before Rachel disappeared. Once at 5.24 p.m., and that call lasted about 15 minutes, and then shortly after that call ended, the private number called back, and then there was another conversation that lasted about 30 minutes. It would take police another 24 hours, but eventually they would figure out who this private caller was. It was a 20-year-old woman named Caroline Robertson who very closely resembled the police sketch of the mystery girl that Allison had seen on the train, and it just so happened that Caroline Robertson lived very close to the Praron train station where Allison saw the mystery girl and Rachel get off. Additionally, Caroline was Rachel's old babysitter and was very close with the Barber family. And so it seemed very likely that Caroline was both the mystery girl on the train and the old female friend that Rachel had mentioned to Manny when she told him about this secret job. This new information was a huge relief. From Michael and Elizabeth's perspective and the police's perspective, it now seemed very likely that Rachel and Caroline had just snuck off together and were now probably hiding out at Caroline's apartment near the Praron train station. And so, believing they could put an end to this missing teenager drama that night, the police hopped in their cars and they drove over to Caroline's apartment. But when they got there at 5.25 p.m., they very quickly realized that things were not as they seemed. Police walked up to Caroline's front door and they knocked and began yelling out for Caroline and Rachel to come outside, but nobody yelled back and nobody opened the door. When they tried the handle, they found it was locked, so they got in touch with the property's real estate agent who came out and gave them a set of spare keys, and when the police tried those keys, they found they still could not open the door because the door had been locked from the inside with a special latch. And so the police began walking around the perimeter of the building looking for another way inside. And as they're walking, one of the officers looks up and sees a second floor window of the apartment is open, and it's open enough that clearly a person could slip inside. And so the police contacted the fire department who showed up very quickly and they put a ladder up against the side of the apartment that went up to that open window. And then a police officer began climbing up. And when he got up to the window and could look inside, he saw he was looking into a bedroom. And at first it looked totally ordinary until he noticed there was a body lying face down at the foot of the bed on the ground. It was Caroline. The officer on the ladder immediately turned around and yelled for backup, and then he and other officers poured into the apartment, and before long, Caroline, who did actually still have a pulse, but she was totally unconscious and not responding, she was being rushed to the hospital. And while that was happening, the remainder of the officers who were on site, they all went into the apartment to try to find Rachel. And so as they're searching this apartment, which was totally messy, there was things everywhere, there were boxes everywhere, it almost looked like Carolyn had been packing her apartment to move, potentially, when something happened to her, causing her to fall unconscious inside of her bedroom. And so the police searched this apartment top to bottom and they did not find Rachel. In fact, there was no trace of Rachel anywhere, except they did find a bag of clothes that looked like they were Rachel's size, not Caroline's size, but it wasn't clear if those were actually Rachel's clothes. And so the police just kind of walked around the apartment gathering up anything that seemed suspicious, like they found rubber gloves and hair dye, they found some bank receipts and some notebooks with some strange writing in them, and they just hoped that some of the stuff might lead to Rachel. Rachel. Back at the hospital, Caroline had regained consciousness, and even though she was very disoriented and seemed kind of out of it, the medical staff allowed the police to come in right away and start asking questions because they knew time was of the essence with Rachel. They had to find her. And so the officers came into Caroline's room, and they sat down, and the first question they asked her was, do you know where Rachel Barber is? And Caroline just stood there kind of stunned for a second, and then just said, yes. Over the next few months, as Caroline's memory came back into focus, she would piece together one of the most unbelievable stories that police in Melbourne had ever heard. The following is a reconstruction of that story based both on Caroline's testimony and on what police were able to actually fact check. 
Back on Sunday, February 28th, 1999, so the day before Rachel vanished, Caroline called Rachel and offered her a job. Caroline told Rachel that she was working on this psychology study and she needed participants. However, the study was highly confidential, so if Rachel did want to be a part of it, she wouldn't be able to tell anyone what she was doing. However, the study was quite lucrative for Rachel and it really didn't require much of Rachel. All Rachel had to do was meet Caroline the following day after school was over, over at the Richmond train station, and then the two of them would ride the train to Praran, they would get off, make their way to Caroline's apartment, and there they would conduct this psychological study, and when it was over, Caroline would pay Rachel $100 and the cost of transportation. And so Rachel, she was thrilled at the idea because she wanted those beautiful blue shoes, and so she said yes. So the next day, Monday, March 1st, Rachel wrapped up school. She made her way to the Richmond train station. She connected with Caroline. They hopped on board the train. They made their way to Praran with Allison spotting them on the train as they went. And then when they got off the train at Praran, Caroline and Rachel would make their way to a nearby pizza shop and get a pizza and some beer. And then they would walk the rest of the way to Caroline's apartment. Once they were inside the apartment, Caroline led them upstairs to her bedroom. And then they both sat down on the floor at the foot of the bed and began eating their pizza and having some beer and just laughing and exchanging some stories. And then after their dinner was over, Caroline told Rachel it was time to start the study and it began with a guided meditation. Sitting next to Rachel, Caroline told her to stay calm, think happy thoughts, close your eyes, and just begin to breathe in nice and slow, breathe out nice and slow, and just feel yourself breathing in and out. And so Rachel did as she was told and began breathing in and out and being very calm. And Caroline, at this point, she stood up and began kind of pacing around the room, watching Rachel periodically and reminding her to think happy thoughts and stay calm and keep just listening to herself, breathe in and breathe out. And then at some point, Caroline just stopped and stood right in front of Rachel and just stared at her really intently. And at some point, Caroline was confident that the drugs she had laced in the pizza that she had given Rachel were starting to take an effect. It it looked like Rachel was starting to doze off. And so at that point, Caroline walked around behind Rachel, who still had her eyes closed. She's still doing the study. And Caroline pulled out a telephone cord. She wrapped it around Rachel's neck and she pulled it as tight as she could. Immediately, Rachel came out of her trance and she reached up and began trying to pull the cord off of her neck. But Caroline was easily 50 pounds heavier than Rachel and easily was able to maintain control over Rachel. And so Rachel is squirming and fighting and scratching and doing everything she can to try to get this cord off, but she can't and eventually the fight just leaves her body and she goes still. Caroline would maintain tension on that cord to ensure Rachel was dead, but then eventually she would release the tension on the cord, at which point she would drag Rachel's body into a nearby closet and she would shut the door. Two days later, Caroline would open that closet up and she would drag Rachel's body back out of the closet with the cord still wrapped around her neck. And she would roll Rachel's body up in a carpet and then stuff her inside of a large army duffel bag that Caroline had purchased for this exact reason, for disposing Rachel's body. And then she called a taxi who came to her apartment and she lugged Rachel's body still inside of this bag and dumped it in the taxi. And then she and Rachel's body and the taxi driver drove about an hour north to rural Kilmore where Caroline's father had a vacation home. And there she would bury Rachel's body in a shallow grave next to one of her childhood pets. When Caroline had been rushed to the hospital because she was found unconscious in her bedroom by police, the assumption was she and probably Rachel had been attacked and that was why Caroline was unconscious. But what really happened is Caroline was in her apartment and she saw the police show up and it made her so stressed that it triggered a seizure and that was why she passed out in her bedroom. When she came to in the hospital and people began asking her what happened, she would say that Rachel's death was an accident. However, months later, after investigators had gone through all of the evidence they had collected from Caroline's apartment, they discovered Rachel's death was anything but accidental. According to the notebooks they found all over Caroline's apartment, which were basically Caroline's journals, Caroline hated herself. She totally loathed her physical image and who she was, and she was obsessed with the girl she used to babysit, Rachel Barber. Rachel was this beautiful, perfect person that Caroline wished she could be. And so one day, Caroline decided she would just stop being Caroline and would literally become Rachel. 
And to do that, she would kill Rachel and assume her identity. The secret job, the psychology study that Caroline offered Rachel was a very intentional trap. She knew Rachel wanted money for things like those blue shoes, and she knew Rachel would trust Caroline. Caroline was her babysitter, and so Rachel would have no problem going into Caroline's apartment alone at night to get the money. Caroline planned to murder Rachel and stage it so it looked like Rachel had run away, and then afterwards, Caroline planned to lose 45 pounds and then get a nose job so she would look more like Rachel. And then to complete her transformation, Caroline would legally change her name to Rachel Barber. In November of 2000, Caroline Robertson pleaded guilty to murdering Rachel Barber and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. In January of 2015, Caroline was released after only serving 15 of those 20 years. In the years after Rachel's death, Rachel's mother, Elizabeth, would write a book about the experience called The Perfect Victim, which would later be adapted into a major movie that starred some of Australia's biggest actors and actresses. On Wednesday, March 24th, 1999, Rachel Barber's body was once again lowered into the ground, except this time she was surrounded by friends and family and people who loved her. Over 850 people attended Rachel's funeral. They brought letters and poems and toys, which were all buried with Rachel, as were the blue shoes that Rachel so wanted that she planned to buy with the $100 Caroline had promised her. So that's going to do it. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please soak all of the like buttons underpants in water and then put them in the freezer.